Well, wonderful. Thank you so much to our, our young people for leading us in worship, Katie and Emma, Aaron and Patrick on vocals, Nico, Eli, Gabby, helping us with the instruments, and a uh, great way to begin our school year of worship here. What will happen if I unplug this? Will it like explode on me? Thank you. I just, I walk around a bit and I don't want to trip. And as you can see, I've got a lot on my, on the pulpit here. Well, um, it's wonderful, wonderful to be able to worship together. Uh, thank you for the music and for everyone that's part of our worship here today. Uh, before I speak, I'd like to uh, have a word of prayer, if you'd bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we just dedicate, we continue to de dedicate this time to you, Father, and in this moment, as we now transition to the focus on the message and specifically on the Bible, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would be here, it would be your voice, your presence that's here, and that all would know that they have been with the living God, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Did you bring your Bibles? Oh my goodness, Andrade's. Gina told me you guys were going to be here. I don't like to embarrass anybody, but I just look up and I see Gloria and Tony here and Caleb and Benjamin. Welcome, guys. We're so glad that they are here visiting. Oh, my goodness. It's just wonderful. What was I saying? Uh, <laughs> do you have your Bibles? Show me your Bibles. Come on, pick them up. Show them to me. Let me see. All right, wonderful. Now, uh, we do allow... If you have the electronic version, Chuck, where are you? Okay. Uh, if you have a tablet, obviously, if you have a phone, you have access to different uh, programs and apps and software. Um, and, and there's pros and cons to everything, of course, but uh, I still am a believer that having a physical bo book, a physical Bible, gives you a, a unique a, a way of uh, interacting with God's Word. And, of course, we're in a, a changing environment where the digital world gives us so many things to offer as well. But over the next few weeks, I'm beginning a series called Your Bible and You. And I am not a graphic designer, okay, so forgive all the little clip art and stuff. I realize the graphic is a little busy, uh, but it just kind of gives you an idea of some of the things we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks, different metaphors that the Bible uses or that the Scriptures use to refer to itself as the Word of God. And we're going to be looking at different elements regarding uh, our Scriptures and how we can become better students of the Word. So I am encouraging you to bring your Bible to church, okay? Now that might seem like a funny statement because I kind of grew up where you always brought your Bible to church. Um, but we've kind of maintained that tradition, but it is fading a little bit, uh, partly because of PowerPoint, to be quite honest. I don't need you to turn in your Bibles as much these days, because I can just put up on the screen whatever I want, and you just got to follow along. Uh, but I am wanting us to bring our Bibles to church over the next few weeks. I want you to get as familiar as possible with your Bible. Let me share with you, uh, this is all introduction, uh, kind of where we're going over the next few weeks, the next couple months actually, of what we're going to be covering during this time. And I want to tell you why I am also focusing on this. It's not that we don't already have great theology on, on uh, you know, the Scriptures and, and we have our Bible classes and our Sabbath schools, but I am under the conviction that we need to enhance and increase our familiarity and our dedication to the Word of God. I just think as we get into the, the days in which we live, the last days, the chaotic days, the confusing days in which we are in, it's no time like the present to really get back to the fundamentals and basics of our holy scriptures. And so that is what the focus is going to be. We're going to talk about Bible versions and translations. This is one of those uh, great arguments that often come up in the church. Just so you know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church does not endorse any specific Bible translation. Many people use the King James, New King James. The clear word is not a true translation, nor is it the endorsed version of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We use a variety of translations uh, throughout our uh, official work as a Seventh-day Adventist Church, but we're going to talk about them. Do you know what translation you're using? Do you know why you use it? Do you know the philosophy of, philosophy of translation? Do you know how your editors put your Bible together? 
Those are some things we're going to be talking about. The history of the canon. How did the Bible books get to be the way they are? Why did the New Testament or the, New, the, the Christian church contain the Old Testament books? What books got left out? What about the Apocrypha? What about the Pseudepigrapha? What about all these lost books that are being found? How can we really trust that the 66 books that are in the Christian Bible are truly the intended works that God wanted to be in 2024? Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Inspiration and revelation. How did God actually inspire it? Did He inspire the words or did He inspire the writer? Did He inspire both or neither? What does that mean? When God revealed something to His prophets and they wrote it down, what exactly, what process took place in order for us to have confidence in our Bible? We'll talk about inerrancy versus infallibility. Is the Bible without error or is it without fault? Does it matter? Is there a difference? We'll talk about Bible study tools, and then the last two are really about the application. How are we using the Bible in our devotions, um, in our journaling, in our memorization? Memorization is something that we really haven't emphasized a lot in the church in the last few days. Most of us have a few great passages memorized, maybe Psalm 23, maybe the love chapter, you know, maybe the Ten Commandments. After that, it's a verse here and a verse there. There's a beauty and a wisdom and a benefit that comes from dedicating yourself to memorization as well. And then finally, the application of the living word in you. Is that clear? Isn't this easy? I mean, we can just do this all right now. Let's just cover it. No, we're going to be, we're, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some weeks. So I just wanted to give you a little heads up of where we're going. The key verse, the key verse that is going to be the main overarching verse throughout the next couple months comes from 2 Timothy 2.15. And I, we're going to take some time to look at this verse right now, and we're going to refer to it um, with regularity during this series. Um, by the way, just so you know, I do still have a kids' quiz coming up. I usually begin with a kids' quiz, but because of this introduction, um, we'll get to the kids' quiz here in just a few minutes. Where's Toby? Oh, over there. All right. I'll need some help when the time comes. Um, I don't usually leave the Bible version up when I put the Scripture. Um, some, for some, it's a distraction, and so I prefer to leave it out. But for, for the purposes of introducing this passage, because I'm going to give it to you in several versions... Um, I left the version. My primary Bible that I use is the New American Standard. Um, by the way, I brought four Bibles, so I win. Just to show you how holy I truly... No, I'm just kidding. These are the four Bibles that were my Bibles and have been my primary Bibles growing up. So, a little bit of sharing time. I always liked having a case. Uh, ever since I was little, I, I, I grew up with having a case. You were cool if you had a case over your Bible. And so, this is uh, the Bible that when I was baptized at the age of nine, it's the New King James Version. Um, I use this uh, through all my Sunday school and, and everything. I have a lot of handwriting notes. I have duct tape in it, yeah, because it was starting to fall apart. So, what do you do when things are falling apart, Dean Mark? You grab your duct tape. Kept my Bible together. I've had a lot of handwritten notes. When I turned 12, you know, um, I joined the youth group in my church and the, the New King James and the King James, that was what my parents used. You know, that's what my grandparents used. And all the cool kids were using NIV. You know, in the 80s and 90s, the NIV was sweeping the evangelical world. It was becoming the translation of, of evangelicals. And so I went with what the cool kids were doing. I got myself a student Bible, NIV, and man, I was holy. Twelve years old, great little notes and things in here that I used. When I graduated high school, my sister gave me a new gift. She gave me a collegiate NIV, same NIV, but now it's for college students, so you're even better prepared. And she wrote me a nice little note. Someone with a highlighter got in here. I don't know what happened there, but she wrote me a little, nice little note. So for four or five years, this was my primary Bible. But when I went to college, after I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I knew that I wanted to have a Bible that would be my primary study Bible, the Bible where I'd keep my notes in, the Bible that I'd become familiar with, and I thought really hard, and I studied really hard, and I came to find that the New American Standard was my preferred version for study and for preaching. I use other versions for other reasons, um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about versions and their pros and cons, but I want us to look at 2 Timothy 2.15 for a second. This is how the New American Standard puts it. Be diligent, Paul writes to the young pastor, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, 
accurately handling the word of truth. From this version, the way we show ourselves approved for God, the way we show we're a workman who does not need to be ashamed, is by we become good, faithful, careful students of the Word of God, okay? Um, Notice that this is not about salvation either. The approved of God, he's talking to Timothy. Timothy has already been ordained as a preacher by this point. Okay, he's not saying you're a sinner and you need to work your way into be approved to God and have your sins forgiven. He's saying, no, now that you're a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, now that you're a follower of Christ, now that your sins have been forgiven, now that you've enlisted in the army of God, God has placed on you an obligation that you need to show yourself faithful to, and that has to deal with accurately or carefully handling His Word. Okay, let's look at it in the New King James. Very similar, same beginning, be diligent, present yourself approved to God, a worker does not need to be ashamed, very little difference here, comma, notice the comma, rightly dividing the Word of God. So slightly different language there, it borrows a little bit from the old King James, the old King James, study to shew thyself approved of God, a worker needeth not, who needeth not be ashamed, that's the King James, it's a little more archaic, a little old fashioned, it's okay. But the bottom portion is identical. King James and New King James are, the, are exactly the same. Rightly dividing the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean division. That doesn't mean uh, setting things aside. It's almost like dissecting, you know, investigating. Rightly dividing the Word of God. Okay? How many of you have a New King James? Any NS, in New American Standards out there? Okay? A couple of uh, righteous people I see. All right, next we're going to go to the NIV. Any NIVs out there? A couple NIVs? Um, the Spanish NIV is Nueve Version Internacional, right? Did I get that right? Perfect pronunciation. Notice the change. No longer be diligent. And these are somewhat semantic, but they can make a difference in how you read it. The NIV says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, but the NIV adds a word. It adds the word and. By the way, I'm not here. There are pros and cons to every version, and we can have all kinds of discussions. The and is not in the Greek, all right? The, the, the NIV and other translations believe it's implied, but you notice there's a difference when you add the word and. When it's just a comma, it means that the Correctly handling the word of truth is directly related to the statement before. The way we show that we're approved for God, the way that we show we're not ashamed, is by correctly handling the word of truth. When you put the word and in, it separates it into two different thoughts. That you can be approved to God, you can be a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and in addition to that, you can be one who correctly handles the word of truth. Now there's again pros and cons, you can debate whether that is important or not, that's not my point here. One more version, okay? One more version. The New Living Translation. Any New Living Translations out there? Okay. It's a great translation. This is the primary translation that our school curriculum uses, okay, in the North American Division. They use other versions as well, but the primary version that's used in our school curriculum is the New Living Translation. Don't confuse it with the old Living Bible, okay? The Living Bible was a paraphrase. It's a beautiful paraphrase, but it's not a true translation. The New Living Translation is a true modern English translation. So they change it a little bit more. They say work hard. So we've seen be diligent. We've seen do your best. The New Living says work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive His approval, be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed. And they also include the word and. And now they have a slightly different ending who correctly explains the word of truth. I love the New Living Translation. That's the version I use mostly for memorization, by the way. It flows very well in English. The New American Standard is hard to do for memorization um, just because of of the word structure. It's great for study. I use it a lot. So you have all these tools. Now, I want to put these together for you, just that last part, and ask the question, which one's right? And which three are evil? Evil. Now, I grew up kind of thinking, what does it really matter? It all basically says the same, and surely these are similar. There's not a huge difference. Application and semantics can be different, um, and you can see different flavors of how the Bible uh, refers to, uh, you know, how we should handle it. Are we to accurately handle, rightly divide, correctly handle, correctly explain? 
But irregardless of which translation you use, you want to know what they all agree with? This is the word of truth. This is the word of truth. And a Christian who has dedicated their life to Jesus has been requested and required to be very diligent or hardworking or to do our very best at handling this document that God has given to us. And I'm not here to point the finger. I'm not here to be uh, uh, negative or worrisome. But I think we've become a little complacent. I think we've become a little complacent as a society, as a denomination, as a church, in how we handle the word of truth. So I think it's a good opportunity for us to reinvestigate and reestablish our foundation and our, our dedication to handling this book. So that's where we're going to go. Um, just again, all kind of part of the introduction. Our goal, my goal in this series is fourfold. First of all, I want you to have great confidence when you hold this book. That when you hold it, you know that you are holding something truly remarkable and special, and that you will not fear to read the hard passages. A lot of people, they love all, oh, the Bible talks about loving your neighbor and forgiveness and gentleness and, and inclusion. I'm not so sure, though, when it talks about divorce and marriage, it's a little awkward. And I'm not so sure about its uh, statements on slavery and polygamy and sexual purity. Those are probably archaic. They make me a little uncomfortable. I'm going to set those aside. I'm going to focus on the other ones. No, if we're being careful Bible students, we will not be afraid to read every word and find its application and meaning for us today. I want us to be better students of God's Word, and I think the more we take time to really investigate these things and become familiar with our Bibles, um, we will be better students. I want us to have a higher commitment to God's Word. I have a question for you. I saw a lot of you raise your Bibles. I'm not looking. I'm not going to look. For those of you who didn't bring your Bibles, do you know where it is? (laughs) Do you know where your Bible is? You know, I have a a place. When I come home and I set my phone down, I set my keys down, and I set my wallet down. I keep them together, you know. I know where they are. And if they're not there... I start to get worried. Where's my keys? Where's my wallet, right? Where's my cell phone? Where's my tablet, Chuck? (laughs) You should have the same feeling when it comes to your Bible. You should know where it is. It should have a special place where you keep it. It can be in several. Maybe you take it to the office. You keep it in the locker. Uh, maybe you carry it with, it with you to school. Maybe you put it on the nightstand. But you should know where your primary study Bible is at all times. Okay? I think these are some of the basic disciplines and skills that we should have. So I have a, a, a story. I may have told this before. Uh, for, forgive me if I have, but I think it's a great analogy. A few years ago, they did a study. I think it was um, with upper teenagers, like 17 to, to 19. They were trying to determine uh, uh, the emotional attachment that they had to their phones. Okay, have you heard this one before? So, under a pretense of doing kind of a, a heart study, they strapped down these teenagers and they put heart monitors on them. Okay? And they told them, now we're going to be monitoring your heart. We're studying for, you know, hypertension or what well, they lied to them. I don't know how, you know, they, they do these studies. But it had to be a double blind study. And they said, now because you've had these heart monitors on you, do you have any electronics on you? You can't have an electronic on you while, while your heart's being monitored. So, of course, they pulled out their cell phones. Like, oh, okay. Well, we're just going to set it beside you. Okay? Now they noticed. When that teenager gave up their cell phone, even though it was within arm's distance, they noticed the heartbeat start to go just a little faster. Boop, boop. So they're, they're doing their work, they're studying, you know, and the, 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 the researchers are coming in and, and they take the phone and they say, oh, I've got to set something here. So they take the phone and they move it across the room, okay? And they're, they're watching the heart. And even though it's still within visual distance across the room, all of a sudden the heart went boop, 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 boop. Okay? 
Then they did an additional thing. They had another worker come in and block their view from the phone. So they're moving things, and they're, they're blocking their view from their phone. And when they couldn't see their phone, their heartbeat started going, boop, 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 boop. And then the last thing they did is the person, you know, that people are coming and going, they come and they move it, they take the phone, and they take it out of the room. Did you know that when they did that, those teenagers' hearts began to beat with the same rhythm that someone that's going into pre-shock or even indicators of a heart attack? Isn't that amazing? The attachment we can have to some things. Now, again, it could have been a phone. It could, you know, back in the day, it was a wallet, you know, your license, your credit card and everything. In a similar way, we want to know where our Bibles are. We should be annoyed. We should be stressed. We should be concerned if our Bibles are in an area or a way that we cannot find them. Does that make sense? It's just a little, a, a, a little analogy and, and kind of fun when it, comes, when it comes to that. So I want us to have a higher commitment and passion uh, for maintaining God's Word. And ultimately, of course, in everything, we want to develop a deeper love for Jesus Christ, who is the Word who is the Word. All right, I know I'm, I have limited time here, and so I'm going to uh, jump into this. I do want to start out with the, the kids' quiz, though, so if I can get just a couple helpers with this. Toby usually helps. Are the black and gray, are they working all right, guys? Owen, are you helping? Oh, I think, uh, I think the boys got it there, Jerry, but I thank you. And for those of you that are new, I usually do this right at the beginning of a sermon. It's just a little interactive time I like to do with the young people in the church. You know that the the first analogy as part of my series here is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. One of the ways that the Scriptures are referred to in the Bible is the sword of the Spirit. Swords are all over the Bible. The first time it's mentioned is in the Garden of Eden. What kind of sword guarded the way to the Garden of Eden? Was it a flaming sword, a glittering sword, a flashing sword, or a twirling sword? Abel has his hand up, and then... Flaming. What'd you say? Flaming. All right, Abel says a flaming sword. Flaming. I got another flaming sword. Any other think that they know better about that? You remember, it's kind of a bizarre statement. It's right there at the end of Genesis chapter 3 after the eviction from paradise. Is that, is that it? Is, are we pretty confident it's a flaming sword? It's all of them. Isn't that tricky? Pastor Dave being tricky again. Depending, it, it talks, the, depending on, on your translation, all right, it can be referred to as a flaming, glittering, flashing, twirling sword. If you have your Bibles... Turn there to Genesis 3.24. I'm just going to do this briefly, so um, Owen and, and uh, Toby just hang tough there. First time a sword is mentioned in the Bible is right here in Genesis. He drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned in every direction and guarded the way to the tree of life. First mention of a sword in the Bible is there in Genesis. You'll notice also the mention of the cherubim. And between the cherubim, you have this flashing, glittering light. A lot of Bible scholars and commentators believe that that is a verbal reference to the Shekinah glory, that in the tabernacle, Moses was instructed on the uh, mercy seat, two angels called cherubim were to be flanking the throne of God. And between those two cherubim came the flashing, glittering, flaming, twirling presence of God called the Shekinah glory. In addition, it's also a verbal reference to Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. When you read about Jesus in Revelation 1 and Revelation 9, He is called flashing, glaring, flaming, and in Revelation 19, a sword is seen coming out of His mouth. A sword is coming out of the mouth of the Lord in Revelation 19. Another sword, number two, Owen, Toby, help out. Who are we talking about here? Now, it came about when this guy was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite with his sword drawn in his hand. Who are we talking about here? Who was there around the area of Jericho and had this interaction? Come on, young people. Is that Elizabeth, Ellie back there? The giant. Say it again. The giant. 
I didn't hear it. The giant. A giant? Mm, close. Did your dad tell you that? <laughs> Come on, people help out. Oh, okay, yeah, back here. Joshua. Who? Joshua. Joshua. You remember the story, Abel? Were you going to say Joshua? Okay. All right, we got some young people helping out. We're talking about Joshua. The children of Israel, they have just consecrated themselves to God. They've just celebrated the Passover. They're about ready to attack Jericho, and Joshua interacts with uh, what we believe to be the Lord because he took off his shoes. It was holy ground, just like Moses did at the burning bush, and the sword of this man was already drawn. And if you remember the story of the conquest of Jericho, it was not the army or the sword of the Israelites that conquered it. It was their faithfulness to the Word of God as they marched around the city and the walls collapsed. So the sword drawn, it was the sword of the Lord and their faithfulness to the Word of God that gave them victory in that story. All right, David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to whoever owned the armor and the sword, I cannot go with these. I have not tested them. And David took them off. Whose armor was David wearing and whose sword was he carrying? All right, A.B. King Saul. Was that what you were going to say too? All right, I see it, guys. Well done. A.B., you are correct. David, if you remember the story, you would think having the king's sword would be a great advantage. You're going to give me your sword? Outstanding. But it was not the Lord's plan that David would use someone else's weapon. God wanted him to use his own weapon weapon when it came to facing Goliath. He had not tested. He had not trained with. He was not familiar with the king's sword. He needed to use his own weapon, which was the sling. Okay? So, maybe a little bit of an analogy there. Last question, guys. Last question. The sword of the Spirit is included in which list? The Beatitudes, the fruit of the Spirit, the armor of God, or the gifts of the Spirit? Which list do we find this, the sword of the Spirit? I see Anna's hand. That, that's Anna right there, Toby. C. <laughs> yes. If you couldn't hear, she said C, so she's correct. It's the armor of God. The sword of the Spirit. Let's just look at that verse Ephesians 6, 17. That's it, guys. Thank you very much. You can just set the mics down there. Give them to Derek. That'd be fine. Ephesians 6, 17. If you've studied the armor of God, it goes through all the different elements and there's, there's symbolic representation when it comes to armor. But it ends with this. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the... You know, it's been pointed out that the only offensive piece of equipment that Paul includes in that list is the sword. Everything else is armor. Everything else is defensive, right? The breastplate, the shoes, the belt that holds it all together, the helmet, all right? That all protects you. The only thing that you have in your hands that you can actually use, you know, to, to fight with is the sword, which is the Word of God. When Jesus was in the wilderness, He used the Word of God. When He was tempted of the devil, He used the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. And verse 12 and 13. Just going to read one more verse here about the sword. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. Are you there? You're probably somewhat familiar. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And the Bible reads this. For the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, of both, of both joints and marrow, able even to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Sometimes verse 13 isn't included, but I wanted to read it as well. And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of Him whom we have to do. That's how the New American Standard translates it. All things are laid bare to the eye of Him 
whom we have to do. Some of your Bibles may say of whom we are accountable to or something like that. You know, it's, it, from the time I was little, I remember hearing about the sword of the Spirit being the Word of God, but I never really took the time to really understand why would the Bible and the Word of God be compared to a sword? I don't know a lot about swords. Do you know a lot about swords? I've only, the only swords I've really handled before are lightsabers. And I don't think that really applies. So I started to do a little research. The sword of the day was the Roman sword called a gladius. It's a short sword. It's only 18 inches long. But for over 500 years, this was the primary elite weapon of warfare. It was different. It was designed specifically for the way in which the Roman army fought. It was meant to be highly mobile. It was not a slashing style sword. It was more of a thrusting style. They were trained to use these swords. When you became, when you were conscripted into the Roman army, you were not equipped with a sword. You had to buy it. You had to buy your own sword. And again, this being the elite weapon of the day, you can imagine what does the most elite AR rifle cost? It's not cheap. It probably took that Roman soldier months, if not years, to pay off the purchase of this sword. The Romans perfected steel making uh, to a higher degree than other empires before them. Most swords were bronze before the Roman Empire. They weren't, re they weren't really sure how to refine iron ore to make it as rigid as it needed to be. But as the Romans uh, developed and other cultures were working with it, they learned how to make steel. And so the Roman sword was stronger and their tactics were better. And again, for over 500 years, um, this was the elite weapon that anyone wanted to have. A Roman soldier, after purchasing their own... And by the way, it wasn't that, that Rome was just greedy and couldn't afford to equip them. They wanted each soldier to pay for it. They wanted the soldier to value their sword because they had bought it with their own money. A Roman soldier was required to practice two hours a day with their sword. One hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon. They had practice yards and sword masters that they would practice with. The sword masters were considered invincible. There's a Latin word for them that I cannot pronounce. The sword masters would do, and you've probably seen this in movies before, they were so elite in their sword craft, they would invite the legionnaire or the Roman soldier to attack them with their real sword and try to kill them. But the sword master was always able to defend themselves and defeat the Roman soldier and to show them where they could improve in their sword play. Two hours a day. A Roman soldier was required to have their sword, their gladius, with them at all times. If a Roman commander was to discover that a soldier did not have their sword, they could be punished with anything from fines to lashings to death. You could be put to death. And you can imagine if you were on guard duty or if you were, had some important post and you didn't have your weapon, that was a big deal. A Roman soldier's, the hilt, was usually wrapped with a leather or a soft material. Romans who used their sword over years, their grip would become so imprinted into their handle that it became like a fingerprint. There's stories that soldiers, a hundred soldiers, could all throw their sword into a pile. And within minutes, they could go and they could find their sword simply by matching the grip that was on their sword. A person who grabbed the wrong sword would be able to feel, wait a minute, that's not my grip, uh, that's yours, Octavio, <laughs> whatever your Latin name is, right? Because their grip became like a, you can imagine, holding this two hours a day, every day. When they would practice with their sword, obviously they would use wood, but they'd also use, um, you know, real swords and things, and they would get nicks and, and all kinds of uh, 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 imperfections. So every day... Every day, a Roman soldier would be required to sharpen their sword. Also, a sword had to be constantly oiled. Why would that be? Because this is not stainless steel, okay? It would rust and oxidize very quickly, and a rusty sword 
was just about worthless. Are you catching any analogies? This is our sword. And some of our swords are rusty. They're lacking the oil. They're lacking the investment of time and the prayers and the Holy Spirit that we invite to guide us in our Bible study. Our swords need to be kept sharp. If a sword doesn't have an edge, it can't accomplish what it needs to be. We need to be sharp in our dedication to understanding God's Word. Two hours a day a soldier would practice with their sword. You ever wonder about that story when Jesus is getting arrested and John tells us that Peter pulled out his sword? It was almost assuredly a gladius. And what did he do? He swiped at one of the guys trying to arrest him, and what happened? Peter didn't know how to use a sword, did he? (laughs) Thankfully for that servant of the high priest, he didn't know how to use a sword because, again, these swords are not designed for swiping. If he'd had training, he would have known it's used for something else. He didn't know how to use a sword. Do you know how to use your sword? Do you think the devil is playing games? Do you think that the devil is complacent in which the days in which we live and he's not worried about the church? Or do you think that the devil is fit out for war? We need the breastplate of righteousness. We need the shoes of readiness. We need the belt of truth. We need the helmet of salvation. But friends, we have a weapon much mightier than a sword. We have the Word of God. And we have been called and required to use the Scriptures as our strength and our foundation to weather the attacks of the devil and to be ready for the challenges that we face in the days in which we live. This is the sword of the Spirit. Are you ready to get it sharp? Are you going to bring it with you when you come to church? As we close, Alex, where are you? Jared, whoever's helping. I have a little handout for you. A little, a little homework for you now that school has begun. Are you excited? <laughs> just for fun. It's just kind of a little bookmark type thing. It's just a little trivia. It asks you some questions about your Bible. Where do you keep your Bible? Do you have a spot for it? Do you know what translation of the Bible you're using? The next one is important. Have you read the preface or the editor's introduction to your Bible? If you haven't, you should. Do you know the translation philosophy for the version of the Bible you're using? Is it formal? Is it functional? Is it literal? Is it dynamic? Is it word for word? Is it thought for thought? Is it paraphrase? What is it? You should know. You should know the thinking behind the group that puts your Bible together. Have you personalized your Bible in any way? Have you signed your name to it? Now, I know some people in their their view of the Bible, they, oh, I don't want to put no marks in the Bible. It's the Bible. I won't ever use underlining, highlighting, or anything. I respect that, if that's your your decision. Um, Others, they mark their Bibles, and and, uh, I do. I mark my Bible as I write notes in it or highlight things. Have you personalized your Bible? And there's some things to think about there. Do you have a Bible that gives you tools for study? Some of our, you know, kind of uh, less expensive Bibles or basic Bibles, there's really nothing in there. But you really should have a Bible that has a footnote system, a cross-reference system, a margin, translation notes, okay? 
These are tools that will make you a better student of the Bible. Does your Bible have the words of Christ in red? That's a very popular thing these days. I can take it or leave it personally myself. Do you know what it means when you see the word LORD in all caps in your Bible? Have you seen LORD in your Bible in all caps? Do you know what that means? Do you know why that is? When I was a kid, I saw it and I thought, oh, it's just a special way of referring to the Lord. It's just the Lord in all caps. There's more to it than that. Does your Bible use italics, asterisks, brackets? Does it tell you when you're moving from prose to poetry? We know in Hebrew and in Greek when they started writing poetry as opposed to prose. Do you know? Does your Bible tell you? Because you read poetry different than you read prose. And you should know when you're reading the difference. Do you have maps and charts, in-text commentary, or other things? Take this and fill it out this week. Familiarize yourself with your Bible. And then lastly, put Psalm 119, verse 160. Are you out? Because we've got more. We got more. Oh, you need a lot more? Okay. Just raise your hand if you don't have one. This is just an activity for you, a little homework. Get familiar with your Bibles. Become a dedicated keeper of the sword of the Spirit. It's not too, it's not too much. Tony, you can do this, right? Yeah, and you can come back next week, and you can tell us all about it. Oh, we have some up here, too. It's the greens, isn't it? Good to see you guys, too. Glad you're here. I hope that you will join us in this journey. I have a lot more to share. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at some of these basics and fundamentals. This is intended to be very practical, very applicable. We will get into theology and and other things along the way as is necessary, but for the most part, I want you to have confidence, comfort, and devotion to your Bible. And if we can do that over the next few weeks, I think God will bless. There's a couple of verses, uh, a verse on the back from the one from 2 Timothy and a passage from Christ Object Lessons. All right, let's pray together as we close. Heavenly Father, we love you so much today. And Lord, uh, we are dedicated to you. We are are, uh, those who are, are living by faith and appreciating your grace. But Lord, you have also instructed us to work hard, to be diligent, to do our best to show you that we will accurately and carefully handle your precious word. You identify your very being with the word. When you tell us in John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Father, in the same way that we want to be respectful and careful And treat your holy word with the sacredness it respects. Please guide us, Lord. We love you today. We want to know you better. And we want to see your will accomplished in this world. Help us as we move forward at this focus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.